Explain that, the debate between the Muslim clerics and the Danish government over these cartoons. It was Tariq Ramadan and I, we were invited. It happened in Geneva. Tariq Ramadan is the well-known um, uh, Islamic scholar who was invited to be a professor at Notre Dame in the United States, and the U.S. refused him a visa. He's one of the most respected Islamic scholars in the world, so I think he ended up, what, at Oxford? Ended up in Ox at Oxford, I think. I like him very much. He's a very, very fine Islamic scholar. He had lunch with the Danes, and I had lunch with the Muslims. So we were crossing like that. <laughs> The um, <clears throat> Danes told Tariq that, okay, 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 I understand there was a reaction to the caricatures, but to burn Danish embassies and burn Danish flags and to boycott our butter, that is going too far. Can you explain what the cartoons were and where they appeared? The prophet with the bomb in his turban. You see, the guy who did it and the guy who published it had been a journalist in the Soviet Union. And he had been so upset by Soviet journalists who were afraid of getting into problems if they published things. And it was called self-censorship. Now, when he came back to Denmark, he experienced self-censorship in his own newspaper, Jyllands Posten. And um, he said, no, we'll publish it. Now, the difference is, of course, between hurting people's deepest religious feelings and in the Soviet Union having a different political point of view. It's not the same thing. I had lunch with Muslims. They were top clerics from Al-Azhar in Cairo. And um, <clears throat> the top clerics told me, this is not about the cartoons. This is not. We are you about the cartoons. We are used to that. And um, we have all this experience that the West has no respect for our feelings. Uh, we could also make some cartoons if we wanted, you know. We can take the whole New Testament and each page can inspire a cartoon if you want to do it. And um, incidentally, they said to me, we happen to know that the Danish cartoonist made a cartoon of Jesus Christ going to heaven. And the cartoonist had the same problem as I had as a young child, being taught Christianity at school. How did he do it? Uh, was it wings or some propelling mechanism or what was it, you know? I mean, it's a young guy who wanted to know the mechanics of things. The editor wrote the cartoonist saying, we're not going to publish it because it will hurt the feelings of our Christian readers. So the Muslim cleric said, aha, Christian readers have feelings, how about we? Now, when the Danish government representatives were told that they knew that story, they knew that the debate was lost. But then the Muslims had another argument. They said, it's not really about the cartoons. It's about the Danish government's refusal to have a dialogue. We want just to sit down, try to explain how we react and listen to your side. Your side is saying it's freedom, freedom of expression. We say it is freedom not to be hurt, humiliated in your deepest feelings. Maybe you could find something, com compromise or something. Expression up to a certain point or something of the type. But it will be refused again, 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 again. We cannot accept that. So what I did as a mediator, Tariq was a little bit silent, if I may say so, but the, anyhow, I'm not silent. I'm not a silent type. So I said at one point that my experience is when you have a trauma of this type, then there are three things you have to do. And I have never in my life as a professor seen people taking a sheet of paper and writing one, two, three, so quickly as these Danes. And from a professorial point of view, to have people writing one, two, three, preparing, you know, it's lovely. <laughs> Point one, a kind of acknowledgement. You don't have to apologize, don't say sorry, and don't ask for forgiveness, that's Christian. Be a little bit careful about that one. But you could say, it was not a very bright thing to do. You distance yourself from what you have done. 
Point two, you have a right to say why you did it. Maybe freedom of expression. Maybe to fight self-censorship. But you also have a duty to listen to the other side. And when I am trying to run this, I say, you have the freedom to do this, but please limit it to a page. Now, take two hours in a room and write it down. And number three, to have a joint project for the future. So you try to clear the past and you build the future, which is the subtitle of our book. So what came out of the meeting was actually, I put it very in blunt terms, I say today is Friday. 13th of February 2006. In three days we have a Monday. My recommendation would be that the Danish government sends out invitations to dialogue. And that would be youth with youth, women with women, politicians with politicians, clergy with clergy, whatever you have. Send it out. And that the acts of retribution against Danish diplomatic and commercial interests are stopped. Then I have a second recommendation. That you appoint a joint commission and that Denmark invites to an international conference on the borderline between freedom of expression and freedom not to be heard. The Danes took number one and not number two. Friday morning, the invitations went out. Friday afternoon, the bombing, the burning, and all of that was stopped. Hmm. How could it be that quickly? Because it was centrally organized, and what is centrally organized can be centrally stopped. You know. hmm. So it worked very, very well for some time. And what happened later is a long and complicated story, but the Danes did not want that conference. I have tried to find out why and they knew it would have to be international, and they were afraid to imply third parties who might be in difficulties. Uh, the country I'm sitting in, for instance. So um, you have that kind of consideration with third parties. So when you say I'm running around the world, one of the things I try to find is a host for that conference. Hmm. Talk about meeting with the Taliban in Afghanistan and assess this war, the longest war in U.S. history, and uh, while you're at it, if you could comment on President Obama. Better keep it quick in order not to against, against laws of um, offending people. You see... Um, I'm just going to make this uh -huh, closer. Uh -huh, a little bit closer. Sorry. You see... Um, <coughs> The problem when you meet Taliban, be that in Afghanistan or outside, is not to make them talk, it's to make them stop talking. And the reason is simply this. If you ask them honestly to explain to you what they stand for, there's nobody who has asked them that, or at least nobody with a Western face like me. They may be asked by somebody to say something, and then to have their arguments quashed and ridiculed and things of that kind. It's not my line. Briefly speaking, they say four things. Point one, we are Muslims. We do not accept secularization. And these winning hearts and minds is all by secular means. Number two, we are 25,000 very autonomous villages and six to eight nations with separate identities. We are not a unitary state with a capital in Kabul. That's a Western illusion. The answer to that is, of course, a loose federation. And at that point, I remember the first time I heard all of this in 2001, I was asking myself, what does this remind me of? And my answer is Switzerland. 5,000 municipalities, very autonomous, and four nations. Now, point three. We want a um, end, an ending to being invaded. An end to the idea that we are a kind of position from which others can run the world. And 
the way we defend ourselves is by autonomous villages and by exactly being divided. There is no point where you can squeeze Afghanistan and say you've gotten it. You can squeeze Kabul, but it's not Afghanistan. Just start squeezing that one. You may squeeze Kabul, but that's all. That's our strategy. We are not going to give up that one. And point four, we suffer from a wound in the middle, the Judan line. And I myself am always amazed when I'm listening to US politicians on this, that they can manage talking three minutes without mentioning the Judan line. Drawn by a British imperialist, foreign secretary in British India, Duran, 1893, as the border between Afghanistan and British India. Now, it's 1,600 miles long, and it runs through Pashtun territory, the biggest minority in the world without a state, 40 million, splits it in two. So when they go from one part to the other, they're not going to a safe haven in Pakistan. They're walking from one part of their own land to another. It's a kind of State Department myth, this Pakistan-Afghanistan kind of thing. And Amy, I would so much hope that if they had the map in State Department and Pentagon, not of states, but of nations, they would see some of the complexity of the world. And maybe also understand the complexity is far more than they can even understand. And these are terribly important and different. So there you have four points. <clears throat> and um, are they acceptable? I think it's totally acceptable that they want Afghanistan Islamic. It's not acceptable that they terrorize women. But they have changed on that one. And I think other Muslims have told them you are an insult to Quran. If you don't understand that this is your tribal custom and it's nothing Quranic in it. And they've gotten around on that one, but they say very strongly, we are not going to be told this by Americans and feminists, and particularly not by American feminists. This we are going to be told by our brothers and sisters in Tunisia, the most progressive country, in Indonesia, in Turkey, in the southern Philippines, 